Hello? No? Yes? Hello. There you go. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Yanni. I am the Arts and Humanities intern for the City of Tacoma Park. Uh, I just wanted to introduce the We Are Tacoma series. This is one of the events that we host, and we have a, a ton of other events that we have, so feel free to grab a brochure that's outside. We have more events that you can check out, or you can check them out at our Facebook uh, page, the City of Tacoma Park, or also our website, which is tacomaparkmd.gov slash arts, so feel free to check that out. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Mary Beth, who introduced the group of poets that we will be reading tonight. Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to uh, say a brief hello and a welcome to uh, our poets this evening Christine Higgins, Ann Lolordo, Madeline Misco, and Kathleen O'Toole. Uh, this is going to be a slightly unusual format, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what these talented folks have uh, in store for us tonight. Good evening. I'm Kathleen, and um, I'd like to say a little bit about um, the book, and then we're each going to introduce ourselves. Um, so Madeline, Christine, Anne, and I have been writing poetry together for over 20 years. We met when we were all moving through and out of the um, master's program in creative writing at Johns Hopkins and uh, were part of a writing circle that included other women who've moved on or moved away. And um, in order to celebrate the 20 years that the four of us at least have hung in there and supported each other's writing, uh, Christine actually said, you know, we have to do something to recognize this and kind of sat us all down to kind of write a kind of a statement about what had kept us together, not just why we were writing, but why this particular configuration was still alive and, um, and what our preoccupations were and our values and what, you know, held us together. And out of that, we started to imagine uh, possibly seeing if there was a collection um, that we could put together uh, jointly. And so we had this great exercise up at a monastery in Baltimore where we kind of laid poems out around the table and began to look at where the poems spoke to each other. And so um, this collection, which we um, will read from tonight, it was really born of discovering really the intersections between our poems and the ways in which this journey of writing together had led to conversations, what I might call quartets. This book in the margins contains seven quartets or conversations of poems. And, um, and we just lifted some lines or fragments out of the poems to mark the ways in which these poems speak to each other. So it's, they're not really themed, but they're more, um, you know, in conversation with each other. And so I'll say a short bit about myself and then uh, my other colleagues will. And then what we're going to do this evening is we're going to read three of the sections from the book. We'll just read the poems together as they appear in the book. And then we're each going to share two newer poems. And we'd be happy to, you know, uh, have a conversation with you afterwards, either about the poems or the writing journey or anything you'd be curious about. So I will say uh, several brief things. One, I am a resident of Tacoma Park now for 
17 years, amazingly. I'd lived in Baltimore for a dozen years before that and came to Maryland as a community organizer uh, to Baltimore where I worked for many years. Um, and so my poetry is uh, at the intersection in some ways of my public life and my um, lived experience in both uh, communities of um, you know, disconnected people, but also at the intersection of social justice and nature, art, beauty. That's where my poetry lives. And you'll hear a little more from me later. Good evening. So um, I'm Madeline Misko. Um, I, am a, I am a poet, and I am also um, a novelist, and I, I write some nonfiction too. So I I'm sort of a Jill of several several uh, trades in that respect. I'm also a nurse. So um, I went to nursing school uh, right out of high school. And from there um, into the um, Army Nurse Corps for two years, uh, back in the late 60s. And then from there um, followed this course because I'd always been a writer. I mean, I'd, I'd always loved writing. So I, I went into um, a, a writing program and got a degree in English as well. So um, I work um, as a nurse uh, still, um, as, a, as an editor of American Journal of Nursing now, and, uh, and I also write, write fiction and teach a little bit uh, every now and then. I'm teaching in the fall at Goucher College in, in the Baltimore area. And um, that's probably enough about me. You'll hear um, some of my poetry later. Hello, everybody. I'm Anna Lalordo. Um, for most of my professional career, I was a reporter for the Baltimore Sun, which took me on a great number of adventures, uh, from police districts to the Middle East and beyond. I uh, left journalism about eight years ago now, and I work for an international health nonprofit that's affiliated with Johns Hopkins. I would say I would mark my writing life either from the fifth grade in Sister Anne de Beaupre's class, or um, when I entered Georgetown University and stood outside the newspaper um, office and decided I was either going to go be a writer for my life or figure out what I wanted to do. And I had a very influential um, teacher at Georgetown that really got me on my journey. I think people here, some people might, I know Merrill, if he was here, would know him well, the late Roland Flint. So um, thank you for having us, and I look forward to, to this evening. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Higgins. And um, like my, my friends here, I, I went to the Johns Hopkins writing seminars and um, decided to stay in Baltimore because it seemed friendly. So, and I did a lot of teaching. I mostly at Loyola, but um, uh, I taught different writing courses. And then I kind of shifted. I'm seeing a trend here too that we we wear more than one hat. So I kind of shifted into the field of substance abuse, and um, started working there. I think because I just needed something new and different to do. And um, then. Um, now I'm, life is a little bit uh, less complicated, and I'm kind of enjoying the opportunity to write. And I also write nonfiction, and I've written a, a memoir that's yet to be published. So, uh, and am I the first? Shall I start? Oh. Oh, okay. So the the first section of the book is what we're going to start with and it's called Memories the Vessel and the opening poem is mine and it's called In the Ofuro and if you don't know an Ofuro is a Japanese bath. She leads me into the tiled room. Seated on a stool she opens the spigot and fills a small bucket. Dipping a cloth she soaps her body and gestures to me, to do the same. I nearly fall off the stool. It is so small and low. I lather under arms and breasts, belly between the legs. 
I avert my eyes and concentrate on the folds of flesh. She stands, moves toward me, and begins to wash my back, scrubbing shoulders, passing the warm cloth down my spine, over the hips, to the coccyx. Then a flood spills down my back from her bucket. She offers me the cloth and returns to her stool. I wash her skin, the nape of her neck, the delicate black hair circling like a thumbprint. The bath is gray and solitary this morning, and the window sweats. We are two hothouse flowers, yellow daylily and calla blooming in the heat. Clean now, she motions me to the big tiled tub. We soak, steam circling our heads. Side by side, we barely touch. Thank you. I think that um, it would be it would be fine if you didn't feel a need to applaud between each one of these, you know. But I, I we really appreciate the applause. But it makes it easier, I think. Thursday. I have to kneel to wash my mother's feet, newly fragile from the surgery. She trembles in the shower, holds on tight to the towel bar. She's balanced slippery as infants I have lathered in this tub. I send a silent prayer up through the steam. Don't let me let her fall. I hardly scrub, but ceremoniously overcome the awkwardness and move the sopping cloth down my mother's legs across her toes. She thinks that she's a bother, but the truth is I am struck with piety and lose myself in washing her like one ordained to take another's precious feet in hand. So this poem is called Music Lesson, The Year Before She Died. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? And um, I just wanted to mention that um, the other thing that happened in my life was that I lost my daughter at an early age, so um, at her early age of 16. So uh, grief became another subject matter for a lot of my poems, so you'll, you'll hear that tonight. <clears throat> I convinced her to take music lessons from a young woman at Peabody who laughed delightedly the first time she heard my daughter sing the scales, exclaiming, I've never heard anyone sing so effortlessly. Every Wednesday afternoon, I'd drive my daughter downtown while she did her homework or put on makeup in the front seat next to me. Then we'd climb the marble staircase and enter a darkened room with wooden slats on the windows and scattered wooden desks. Danya was teaching her a song from the music man, and when I would hear the romance of it, sweet dreams be yours, dear, if dreams there be, sweet dreams to carry you home to me, it would bring forth tears that would not fall or splash, but lolled on the rim like a note stretched out in time. Their voices, the heat, the close of another August day. I rummaged drawers of half sleep for the voices of my three aunts, lest time erase the special timber of their speech, the way Anne's laughter endures despite the din of a decade's chatter. 
erupts in rust raspy bursts, gin fizz from a barkeep's wand, her lucky strike aloft. Then Flo died, yet I still hear that twang in her vowels, the wah-wah of a trumpet solo at the Sons of Italy dance. Last, let Ginny's cigarillo tones request a tango. My memory's the vessel, an old jar, lid punched with holes to let the fireflies live. The next section that we're going to read from is called For the Missing. And my poem happens to be the first in that section, so I'll stay up here. <clears throat> Requiem at Compline for Kevin, 1952 to 2000. When I heard that you had died, I found a deserted beach to make my peace with you. We skirted sandpiper tracks, full moon illuminating the tide pools around our long running tango. The wash of waves dissolved the last echoes of your, trans your confession, cleared the musty relics of each transgression I harbored, softened the hair shirt you'd woven of small kindnesses over the years. Now I imagine you above our bickering voices, redeemed at last from doctors and dialysis, free to ramble, to douse in a philosopher's realm, spirits flickering in amity without this need for words. My poem has something to do with feng shui. Uh, so let me just give you a little background. Uh, I'd moved into this new house with my husband and he was insistent that we get a feng shui consultant in to ensure that everything in the house was properly placed for good chi. I thought it was poppycock, but I agreed as spouses often do. But I found um, that um, the report from Ms. Johnson, the feng shui consultant, um, had more relevance than I expected. Report from Ms. Johnson, feng shui consultant. Plant a garden in the missing area, south corner of the house, the children's space. He transplants hostas, green and white nosegays, delicate lavender flowers on a tall, slender stem. They will seed, the gardener says. They will multiply. Move the couch. Keep the life force flowing. In the creative cycle, burning wood feeds fire. She stacks oak, hickory, chestnut in a pot beside the fireplace. Wood feeds fire. From fire, ash. From ash, a bird rises. Hang a white picture frame on the west wall. Wedding picture, traveling landscape, photo of an unknown couple dancing in Venice. In China, a widow wears white for the missing. The wind from the west soothes like a lullaby. Paint the bedroom. Yellow frequently used to good effect for a couple trying to have a child. Vases of daffodils, daylilies, Alstromeria overtake the dresser. Windowsill, nightstand, she arrives with her arms full. Bed is in the command position. No adjustments necessary. She dreams of a safari, seven days in a land rover across India, searching for a white tiger.
the title of this poem is Grief, and there is an epigraph. After a visual AIDS diary by Devorah Kleinbeast, and the visual AIDS diary actually refers to a, a piece of art. Um, Kleinbeast uh, took a diary that she um, kept while her husband was dying of AIDS, and she, after his death, she dismantled the diary and used the paper uh, to make this gorgeous work of art entitled A Visual AIDS Diary. Grief. They named it for the aftermath, Gravis, that heaviness. But looking back, wouldn't you agree the moment you would name the moment you first realized the loss was geological, the way the heart shifted, fractured at the fault, and astral, faith and hope and love exploding weightless, spectacularly in and of the air. Splinters of song, showers of fragrant light, too bad you haven't got a photograph to mount and frame in gold. But still, sometimes, against a perfect dark, haven't you seen it floating by? The birth of grief, that star. Gaman, the Atlanta Holocaust Museum. And Gaman is Japanese for enduring the seemingly unbearable with dignity and patience. They could only bring what they could carry, 110,000 Japanese forced to relocate to remote Topaz, Utah, a spot where the sands whirled in the summer and in the winter snow drifted through the gaps of the whitewashed tar paper shacks. The women fashioned pipe cleaner flowers, which they preserved under industrial-sized mayonnaise jars. The men painted landscapes with black ink or created teapots from slate. Mothers used the empty flower sacks to make military sashes for their sons. The red string used for knot gathering dotted the material like tiny drops of blood. I saw such beautiful things made from their grief, relieving my own. A peach pit carved and polished into a ring, painted birds in miniature with snips of screen for their tiny feet. The name of this section of the book is called Testing the Truth of It. View Interrupted. From the land, there is light, more of it, though gray and ashen, plumes filling the cathedral of the air, now a canyon, negative exposure, twin shadows replaced by light, no fixed address, this way and that, easy to lose your bearings. At Canal and Sixth, a view clear south to the river. From the sea. Boarding the ferry, Wall Street bound, suits at the rail, gulls circling in the haze, their cries overtake the roar of engines, a droning engine, on approach, not a word. To a man, not a word. Uninter uninterrupted view, interrupted. In the glare of the sun, the Empire State Building is what you see. From the air, a smoldering heap, the color of ash, timbers of steel, debris piled high, remains of the day, everlasting. The eye catches on a crane draped in red, 
a tall building, red-roofed. To the east, green leafy treetops at the edge, a marble blue river, and the long white wake of a ferry. Empty pockets. I think of you without a scent, without a cigarette, trouble with your liver and your spleen, in this heat, without a drop of sweat left to give. I think of you when I slice open the cantaloupe and when I run my fingers through my daughter's clean hair, when soapy water slides across my skin, and when I slip into French, freshly laundered socks, I think of you. I dive into a pool, my arms stretched out to swim, and I think of your need, cheeks hollowed with hunger, head falling forward in sleep, leathery skin, swollen ankles, empty pockets, shoes unlaced. In better times, you could have been a walking Calvin Klein ad, but today, from behind your hospital wheelchair, I see what you see every day, people brushing past you, faces turned away. They can't know that after I bummed you a cigarette, you struggled to your feet and balanced on one good leg, that you smiled and said, come on, get in, it's your turn. Marching to Zion, in memoriam, Reverend Vernon Dobson, 1923 to 2013. At your funeral, no one's thundering at the, sorry, let me try that again. At your funeral, no one's thundering at the injustice of our loss. No one to sling a brass-plated epithet like you from that pulpit, hewn in a movement's resilience, your wit now silenced. My fondest memories kept as photos in sepia, you seated behind your desk, head down as if brooding, before a scathing insight carved six pounds of hubris from some politician's hide, or your voice booming through the congregation's hymnody at a public assembly, marching us to Zion, or imparting your blessed assurance with the heat of a branding iron. This is our story, lest we forget. You knew we'd be testing the truth of it before long, too much at stake on the streets of Baltimore. American Cortege, after Cortege a Litany by Marcel Dupre. Stand now at the curb of time, hand against the heart. The great cortege is passing through this hour of pause. Crane the imagination, impossible to see the head of the line, the first to roll heavily past his mother's weeping eyes. This one now, when and where was he lost, this farm boy from Vermont? No time to wonder. The tolling bell, the drums, the bugle, and now he moves beyond our view, all his sweet particulars draped in the color of the universal, red for sacrifice, white for innocence and for absence, blue for those dispassionate skies above the battleground. As for the litany, impossible to name them all. Grip the heart then for the crescendo, the weight, the unbearable rolling on and through. And I think 
since um, we're, we're now going to um, each read two of our own newer poems that are not in the book. And it kind of makes sense for me to go first because um, I'm going to read two poems which are sort of in the same vein as the one that I just read, um, American Cortege. I'm going to read two poems rising from what I from what I personally know about the moral injuries of war. Um, they're hard poems for me to read. Um, they are separated um, from my actual experience um, as an army nurse um, and, from a, and from each other, actually, by uh, many years. So I served in the army in the 60s, late 60s, and I didn't write the, the first poem I'm going to read um, until 1991. And the second poem that I'm going to read um, is newer. I wrote it about uh, a little, little more than two years ago. White flame before the long black wall. Miles from this wakefulness, the long black wall keeps naming the dead. Vowels and consonants glimmering in the moonlight, a roll call the stars read. Shall I leave the solid yellow of this kitchen, the air pure with the sleep of my children, the comfort of this table with its bowl of fruit? Shall I go to the long black wall and press their names into my hands? What are their names? I have lost their names, lost their stories, the other side of all these years. What of remembrance, that distant window? Window gleaming in the white hot sun, Texas, August 1969. The ledge white on white, pigeon droppings here and there, and pigeons gray fly white in the waiting air. The patients arrive glistening white, stripped and slathered with sulfonilamide, their privates draped in cloths, small, white. And the freshest burn is thickly white, and sheets lie long and flatly white, where a leg or an arm is gone. Oh, death wears white in this hard white frame, and bides his time with the fires of Vietnam. The room beyond the window flares again and again and again. Now a Marine, age 17, brown eyes, one arm, no legs, flesh cut away, swirls of blood in a dead white tub. He cries my name, nurse. I watch him burning down white flame, white flame before the long black wall that keeps naming, naming the dead. New Year. It has an epigraph. Merry Christmas, boys. A greeting on a wreath at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial of Baltimore County. In the winter dusk, I round the corner of the courthouse and there it is, that block of granite carved with the names of so many boys of my generation, same as ever, but graced now with snow. I remove a glove and touch one name, a boy I might have fumbled toward in the dim light of the CYO, a boy I might one day have kissed, but for a certain number in the draft. I take a photograph. I don't know why. I see myself reflected in polished stone, bundled against the cold, camera blocking half my changed face. Oh, dear boys, all these hometown years, these Christmas wreaths, Easter lilies, paper flags 
on Memorial Day and the 4th of July. I don't know what to bring, but here I am. My kids are older now than you were when you kissed your weeping moms and flew away to Nam. My kids have children of their own. So this uh, poem is about, it's called All My Girls, and um, and I'll read it to you. <laughs> I couldn't decide what I wanted to say. Um, they are all mine. In her absence, I care for them as best I can, delivering her lively messages. Life is a playground. Never hold back. Stand tall, golden. Katie, who once sang with my daughter, sings around the world now. And Cassie, just out of college, working at NIH, still loves SpongeBob. Izzy, our daily morning coffee date, has gone off to New York to become a children's writer. Roxanne, now in college, studying political science, says that my daughter is her role model for faith. What an irony, my child who rejected organized religion. In Philadelphia, I visit Rosie, the friend more like a sister. Rosie is studying neurology, learning how the brain can revolt. We go out to breakfast, then we shop for her new apartment, and I buy her things I would buy for my daughter if she were still here. Bath mats, throw pillows, a cordless drill. We buy sheer curtains for her bedroom so the morning sun can come pouring in. And uh, this is um, a poem that um, I think we all are um, so grateful for your presence and for your love of poetry. So um, this poem is called Poetry Flows from Hawa. The clinic was abuzz with news about a woman who had been murdered. Two officers appeared looking for clues. They told us when they opened her apartment door, the smell overwhelmed them and drew them to the kitchen. Her body was so thin, her frame so slight, she fit into a plastic container, hidden underneath some folded clothes. The officers used her birth name, so it took me a while to realize they were talking about a woman I knew. By the African name, she gave herself, Hawa, which means desire. She came asking about the poetry workshop I was forming. She asked me would I like to hear one of her poems. And when I said yes, expecting her to return to me with paper in hand, she opened her mouth right then and out flowed a poem, a bubbly sound like river running over stones. She wore the rich colors of the earth and copper glitter on her cheeks. She had an arm full of bangles and an arm that wheeled her oxygen. I wanted to plead to someone, though I don't know who. She was already dying. Wasn't that enough? Found in a closet in the kitchen, dead in her house for over a week, even her sister, slow to discover her. Thank you. A knot that holds. Another husband to bury, and not yet sixty. Sleepless, the dog settled down, whining in their crates, waiting for him to slip them a biscuit. Even the mailman knows and offers condolences with a check. Widow's pay. No comfort there. He was my second, a sailor from the eastern shore, Old house and boats, a garden of perennials, and three terriers kept us busy. Good with his hands, he'd strip and hand polish century old pine plank floors because, as he said, they're worth it. I was good with the finances, paying the bills the old fashioned way, managing the 401ks for the day when there were no more houses to rehab, 
no more mainsails to mend or climbing Don Juans to prune. That day arrived, creeping like smoke, filling the room until he couldn't breathe. This was the summer he was to teach me to sail the Cape Dory and settle eighteen years of debate over which was the faster boat, sloop or yawl, the perfect cove, Mooney Bay or Goose Creek, the knots that hold, figure eight, constrictor, double overhand. I thought I had perfected the anchor hitch. Two rounds turns back through the carabiner, snugly tied and set, a knot that holds even as tension on the line changes. Eyes of the Crab. 55 Cancri D, star in the constellation Cancer, dragging five sibling planets bathed in watery clouds. We are only two running in the starry dark, away from the Cancer house where we sat up with our mother, talking, 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 until she dozed off from the morphine. Rocks fall to earth. Celestial disruption. Stones placed on a headstone. Two sibling planets skittering backwards, trying to recover, trying to align. Thanks. This first poem um, was published recently and um, I guess I couldn't resist reading it, given what's been in the news this week <clears throat> in the Middle East. Starlings. The children swarm outside the supermarket, arms flailing. Their high-pitched exclamations surround me, my own arms laden with groceries. My mind suddenly shifts to tally one week's arithmetic of grief. Eighty children among the hundreds killed in a fine-tuned cone of shrapnel, three siblings on a Gaza rooftop before the missile landed, and four cousins on a beach incinerated in the time it takes me to close the car door. Tonight, the trees are full of starlings. Their racket rising into a delicate tremolo, like in that Bernstein sonata for violin that stretches the strings almost to breaking. And this last poem is a bit of an odd duck. Um, there was a poetry contest that Madeline and I wanted to enter because the judge, Christian Wyman, is a poet we very much admire. And we talked about, oh, do you think we could write kind of a Christian Wyman poem, which of course is impossible. But um, they, it was this bizarre contest that had a theme kind of inscrutable about, I think it was called, Reality Has Never Let Me Down. OK. Um, take that any way you want it. But um, it, the group is called New York Encounter. It's this kind of lay Catholic organization. And so they have a lot of focus on you know, encounter in the sense of the universe, relationships, whatever. And I'd actually written this thing about a kind of bizarre encounter I'd had in a conversation with a painter in France the summer before where I'd been on a poetry residency in the southwest of France. And he was sitting there with an exhibit of his paintings in an old chapel. And I tried to engage him in conversation about kind of his creative act and his rather mysterious reply, which I found both humorous and kind of deep, um, led to this poem. It, it won third prize in the contest, by the way, so I guess it kind of fit, so whatever. Um, at the Mariner's Chapel, Ovilar. St. Catherine carved in white marble vigils over the remains of a church once filled with grateful gifts from sailors who thanked her for their safe return. 
Today, between a timbered ceiling and the cool embrace of undecorated granite, mysterious landscape paintings grace the walls, scenes of fog with dark hints of mast or bow, yellow orbs that suggest sun, brown brush strokes of bird feather, impressions of, a distorted, of distorted angel wings. The artist is reading a book. I approach to ask him, myself perhaps too, how much of what has emerged to shimmer indistinct on these canvases was born of clear intent, how much the random encounter of paint and canvas, an emergence absent the strong arm of will. Where, I wonder, has the ego yielded lines to shadowing a palette of sun and gathering clouds into feathering flight? His reply, tossed like a pebble, echoes, does it not all come from the void? Myself at the well's rim, listening. Thank you. Um, that's the end of our reading, but we'd love to, oh, thanks, you can clap now. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. Um, but we'd love to take a couple of minutes to answer any questions you might have. When we've done these readings um, as a group, because the book is kind of unusual in that, I mean, if you pick it up, and we do have some for sale back there, um, we didn't, we decided not to put our names on the poems. There are initials, if you really need to know whose poem is which, because we felt like we wanted the poems, you know, to be a collective, a shared creation, because we feel like that's kind of what we've been doing, you know, supporting each other's work for all these years. And so we wanted it to be a seamless book with four authors, as opposed to Kathleen's poems and Anne's poems. Oh. So we thought we'd just open it for a couple of minutes to any questions that people might have about the book, the poems, the, our writing process, and um, we'll be done by 8.30. So anyway, um, uh, any thoughts, questions that any of you might have? He's got a microphone, but you can also yell it out. <laughs> Hmm? They're happy. You don't need oh, okay. to ask any questions. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much for appreciating. Oh, yes. Uh, so, 20 years writing together, first of all. Uh, Been 20, almost 25 now, yeah. Please say congratulations. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, oh, man. Uh, uh, that's something very, very special, and uh, uh, I, I can see the affection, and I can hear the resonances. Um, I, I just wondered if you would talk a little bit about the impact that you believe you've had on each other's writing. Could we use that so that you it, so certainly that it's not just could? One of us. It yeah. makes way more sense. Yeah. <laughs> so that anybody can answer this. Um, anybody want to take that? The impact we've had on each other's. I mean, I will say just because I'm holding the microphone that as I read these poems, um, and some of them were written like 15 years ago, right? I can still remember. Oh, Madeline suggested that word in the or you know, like I think our fingerprints are all over each other's work because we've been at it so long that each of us kind of knows what the writer is trying to get at or, you know, and so I think our, the suggestions that we make for each other's poems are really in the service of what we know to be the intent of the other. That's my take on it. I think everybody needs an editor. Uh, and these are my editors. I'm a terrible revisionist. I don't like to do that part of the work, and that's really sometimes the hardest part of the work. So um, I f have found that over the course of our 20 years that Kathleen, Christine, and Madeline have been the editors of my poem and, and, and poems. Um, in fact, the poem that I read tonight, um, A Knot That Holds, when I was typing it up, I at, the top beyond, at the top of it said, you know, Kathleen's suggestions. <laughs> so <laughs> this was the third revision that and she. I got the knot names yeah, she. Yeah, we. They helped me with the knots because they're sailors. Um, so, uh, so I, that's how I think. That's how 
in my view, what's helped me. It's sort of like when I started to, I've run off and on for a good chunk of my life, but I always run best when I have people to run with. And I think it's the same thing here. Okay, sure. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, you have a good voice? I can project a little bit. Okay. Uh, just wondering, you know, if you all, I don't know if you, you said, it sounded like you all had a similar background, education, training, writing seminars or, or whatever it was. Was there an author or a couple of authors that you shared as, as an influence when you were sort of forming as poets? Actually, we, were, um, we weren't in the same class, but we did meet each other at Johns Hopkins. So we, we did have different teachers in the, in the classroom. And I would say that we all have, the, and that's actually what we bring to the group. I mean, like we all have different mentors and different, uh, we're, not, we're definitely not the same style as yeah. poets. So um, that, that comes into it, you know, I mean, Kathleen's, mention of Christian Wyman, for example, um, we, we actually sort of at the same time discovered Christian Wyman, but she will, you know, will bring to the, to the group what she has read, and, and that, is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah, I think our, our, our influences are, are quite varied, but we, we do bring them in and, and, and share, which is, which is great. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, we all came to, so I, I would say we all came to poetry at an early age, like Anne mentioned her grade school nun teacher, you know, my, my mother. I mean, we all had early influences, and I think our writing journeys were shaped by, by happened to all at, you know, relatively similar ages decide, okay, it's time to go to a graduate writing program. But I think that was only like one stop along, you know, very different journeys. And we do have similar um, backgrounds, I mean, we laugh about, we all kind of all started out as Catholics, we're not all, you know, there anymore, but there are some similar, you know, seed beds, I guess, for our writing, for our imagination, but our voices and, uh, and forms and styles are very different. Um, you know, some, you know, kind of, we, in the, in the opening of this book, we talk about things that kind of overlap, like a certain, you know, uh, irreverence and uh, kind of 60s bred kind of restlessness and you know, rebellion, you know, but uh, other than that, and then I guess I was thinking tonight, God, we're all getting up there. I mean, we're writing a lot more about death, you know, um, but that's the product of being, you know, the age we are and the things that we've all experienced, frankly, in the 20 years we've been together, much of it. Um, but we do write lighthearted poems too. We just didn't consult each other about what we were reading tonight, so. I don't know about you, but I still have some more applause uh, stored up. What do you say? So my name, Chris, yes. Microphone? All along inside my head like a refrain from every one of those people I kept hearing, I am the grass, I cover all. And you now it's so American what I'm hearing, and so connected to Whitman and Sandberg and all of the, of course, many, many women poets as well, known and unknown. But uh, I just, I feel right at home. <laughs> I'm so happy I came here. But, well, as far as the happy to be here, uh, I'll say the same thing. Um, I, my name's Mary Beth Hatem, and uh, Usually in my poems, I make you laugh. Uh, but uh, so the idea, and tonight was so serious, and, and I, I have to say, I sort of loved it. I was at the uh, Poor People's March on Monday. Do people know about the Poor People's March, a campaign for moral revival? Uh, I encourage you to find out about it, and uh, Reverend William Barber's 
uh, idea that what we need now is a moral agenda. We don't need Republicans, we don't need Democrats, we don't need this policy, we need, don't need that policy. We need to look in our hearts and, and be headed in the direction that our hearts suggest we should be moving in. So it's not about this proposal or that proposal. It's about listening to people who are trying to survive on uh, wages that are not survivable. It, it's about having a war budget as opposed to a peace budget. It's opposed, ah, and I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. I'm going to send you to William Barber. And I'm going to encourage you to sign up and follow the Poor People's Campaign. There's going to be actions on the mall every Monday, 2 p.m., until the giant big rally on, on June 23rd. And uh, it, it's really something that I've never seen before. It's very grassroots. These demonstrations are happening in state capitals all over the country, as well as here in the United States. So uh, I was really in the mood to be serious. And uh, so I, I thank everybody for that. And yeah, I did hear the humor here and there. Um, it, the tone felt exactly right to me. And uh, I, uh, I could feel it in the room that uh, it felt like you all were just exactly what we needed. And we need other uh, voices, and we need other tones, and other kinds of poems. And I'm hoping that uh, I'll see many of the people who are sitting in these chairs at next month's third Thursday reading, which will be an open reading. Now here, here in Tacoma Park, when we have an open reading, you want to be here, really. You want to be here. Uh, uh, the, the kind of community that you know we've seen uh, here tonight, I, I think we in Tacoma Park are very fortunate to have, to have uh, here in town. You walk around town and you see the little poetry posters. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have a wonderful po poet laureate, Mara Leffler, who at the last minute wasn't able to be here because he needed to be honoring another poet. Uh, Ann Becker is here, our second uh, poet laureate, who has done wonderful s things for the poetry community here in Tacoma Park. I've been on the receiving end of uh, many beautiful uh, evenings of uh, Anne's uh, monthly workshop, uh, Writing a Community. And, and I, so I just want to say that uh, it, it means a lot that you're here, and I hope we'll see you again and again. And the, thir the third Thursdays that you're not able to be here, you could actually go to YouTube and look for We Are Tacoma Third Thursday, and you can see these readings um, as a whole. So I'd encourage you to do that. That's one reason why I insisted on marching up here to talk to you, uh, so that I could fill the TV screen. I, th I thank you all so much, and I would encourage you to stay with us. Uh, you'll want to talk to the authors some more, and you'll want to have a little snack with us uh, before you head off. And, and you also have an opportunity to take a look at this marvelous book. Thank you all so much.